So I'd like to introduce now uh, Dr. Natalie Herndon. We're very, very uh, welcome, welcome you for the first time as speaker. We're very glad that you're here. Natalie is an extremely, extremely interesting person because she, she, she bridges, thank you, there's not a wall, there is a, <laughs> she bridges the borders between uh, more standard clinical psychology and archetypal psychology. Very, very important thing to be doing. Um, in, her, in her description of uh, her interest, she says um, her interests are um, issues of abuse, trauma, anxiety, panic, depression, substance abuse, identity issues, self-worth, self-esteem, Depth psychology, dream work, Jungian, depth, archetypal, transpersonal models of psychotherapy. Whoa. What I wonder is how did you find my psychological profile? <laughs> 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 Dr. Herndon is, uh, is also making other bridges. She is chair and administrator of the archety archetypology of everyday life. What an interesting, interesting term. I hope that we hear more about it. So uh, she's going to speak with us this morning concerning Kestia, that, that will very much be a resonance of uh, Hermes healing. Good morning, everyone. I would like to steal a little technique from Dennis Slattery. I'm going to light the Hestian flame here for us to bring Hestia into the room with us this morning. <coughs> There's a famous quote by Carl Jung which states, one looks back with appreciation to the brilliant teachers, but with gratitude to those who touched our human feelings. The curriculum is so much necessary raw material, but warmth is the vital element for the growing plant and for the soul of the child. When I was asked to choose an Olympian to write about, I felt as if I had already been introduced to Hestia and felt this type of gratitude for the teachers in my life. As a child in southern Mississippi in the center of the Greek Revival South, Hestia was there in my grandmother's home. My grandmother, Natalie Brown, was an elementary school teacher for 40 years. Her home was a regular meeting place where conflicts were calmed down and etiquette was observed. First and foremost, she held sacred the act of service to family and community. She was the feminine neck which turned the masculine head. All the while remembering the dignity of manners, of hospitality, and of charity. In my professional life in Salt Lake City, I found a similar Hestia figure in my mentor, Dr. Paula Swanner, who was the guiding force and inspirational energy in a group she brought together through her own soulful magnetism called Archetypology of Everyday Life. It was through this group, through their acceptance and encouragement, that I felt the warmth necessary for an alchemical transformation into the eros of depth and archetype, creating a rainbow of vivid myth which illuminated my personal and professional psychologizing and soul making. Now, I am grateful for the Hestia figures of Dr. Joanne Stroud and Dr. Gail Thomas who create this place of gathering around the hearth for all of us and for countless others. Thank you both for creating this sense of warmth and nurturance <clears throat> from which we are all benefiting and where James Hillman found as a place central to his own work and a place for him to call home. A quote from Hillman in his essay on Hestia states, quote, she was the glowing warmth emitting hearth. That is her image, her locus, her embodiment. Hearth in Latin is focus, which can be translated into psychological language as the centering attention that warms all to life, all that comes within its radius. This is Hestia. In short, she is only in, and like consciousness itself, not an object seen, but an enlivening, an enlightening focus, the sole essence that inhabits anything." End quote. As we enter into the topic of Hestia, let's briefly go back into the raw material of her myth. In the myth of the Olympians, Hestia is the firstborn child of Cronus and Rhea, a child of time and is the goddess of the sacred fire of hearth and home. 
She presides over ritual in all transitions of life. She is the sister of Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, Dem Demeter, and Hera. She and all her siblings were swallowed by their father at birth. Being the first swallowed, she was also the last to be disgorged, and as such, she was named both the eldest and youngest of the six children of Kronos. She was thereby given the first offering of every sacrifice in the household. The center of Greek life was the hearth and home. The circular hearth is where food was prepared and was the center of warmth and was also used as a sacrificial altar. The temple of Apollo at Delphi was considered to be the omphalos, meaning the navel of the world. Thereby, the sacred flame of Hestia was central to all. The flame would be taken from the temple of Apollo at Delphi and be carried to the public hearth in the city temples, located at the center of each city, and from there would be brought into each home. The flame at Delphi and in the public hearth was never allowed to go out. Her temples were circular and served by virgin priestesses who dedicated their lives to her. Hestia is one of three virgin goddesses, together with Artemis and Athena. Apollo and Poseidon uh, wooed her as rival suitors after the dethronement of Kronos, but she petitioned Zeus and was allowed to remain a virgin forever. Once, Priapus, drunk after a feast attended by the gods, attempted to violate her while she slept, but a donkey brayed out loud and she awoke screaming, causing Priapus to flee in fear. She is the goddess of the hearth, home, domesticity, family, community, and the state. She represents also the qualities of humility, modesty, charity, hospitality, self-sufficiency, personal security, and happiness. She is known as the goddess of architecture, having invented the art of building houses. She is rarely depicted in art and almost had no part in myths. In ancient art, she is sometimes seen as a woman in a simple dress with the staff in her hand, standing by a large fire. She never took place in disputes and instead was the central point, the meeting place. Hestia's throne on Mount Olympus was very plain and made of wood with a cushion on the throne made of undyed wool. She gave up her throne for a simple tripod next to the hearth so that Dionysus could have a spot amongst the Olympians. Because of this, she was offered the first and last libations of wine at feasts. In his paper, in Hestia's preposition, James Hillman suggests the following, quote, In is the key preposition in analysis, more important, I believe, than with. In is the key direction of psychological movement, the key location of psychodynamics, and the privileged position of soul values. And he asks the question, what then is the power? Who is the god or goddess that draws us in and keeps us in? What is this archetypal insistence upon interiorizing and upon preserving the sanctity of the inn? I believe the answer to who is Hestia." End quote. Now let's describe the therapy space. What is the environment which can best facilitate the going inward? The term temenos is used often in analytic work and in-depth psychology and means a place set apart, a holy place, reserved for the worship of the gods. In the myth of Hestia, if the flame in the home were ever to go out, one would go back to the city temple to gather the flame to reignite the hearth fire in the home. Likewise, the city temple could also go back to the temple at Delphi to gather holy flame. Ritual and sacrifice would accompany the reigniting of the sacred flame. Hestia's hearth is her holy sanctuary, her Timonos. Yet for Hestia, her holy space is also within the heart of every home, centered and centering. We can be conscious of what it may mean to stand within that holy space of home and hearth, but then also to imagine having a source of that sacred fire within, symbolically seeing a flame within the center of every self. So then, one holy place for tending of that flame within the self as a ritual space is the safe container of the therapy room. For many people, there is no sacred fire in the parental home or in any place for them to use to reignite their own inner fire. There is no ritual devoted to tending that flame, and as a result, one feels disconnected and depleted. They may come from a home that was cold and where they were unseen by mother and father. Now in adult life, they are filled with self-doubt, neither trusting themselves nor others. They rely on the rational mind to cope with their life and in their relationships with others. They have no place of refuge or regeneration. The inner fire 
is either out or it's slowly dying. This is why it's so important to create a space of ritual and relationship, of presence and conscious focus, a therapeutic temenos for the client to have as a place of tending the fire to then take back to their own home and hearth. This regular practice serves for them as a way to learn how to tap into the depths of their own centered self for the source of their own flame, to be in an environment of psyche, and for them to identify and have relationship with the Hestia archetype from themselves. By inviting Hestia into the temenos of the therapeutic relationship and identification with the Hestia archetype, she serves as a container of warmth, nurturance, and support for encounter with all mythic figures. Hestia being the goddess of the hearth, the sacred fire, she is present in ritual and transitions of life. With Hestia and the Temenos of Therapy, we can witness what is timeless, i.e. the collective unconscious, the anima mundi, dreams and mythic images, contained in a weekly ritual of space and time. Likewise, these life transitions are narrated within the container of ritual in the sacred space of therapy. The unconscious then may not be seen as an abyss, but rather as a going in and a being in. Hestia is present, conscious, and focused on the other as they go through transition. The other feels that they are being witnessed in relationship to Hestia. Hestia creates in the therapy room the paradox of a symbolic safe container, but with infinite depths. Centeredness within the self is like a circular hearth fire in the home. As Jeanette Perry states in her book, Pagan Meditations, quote, Hestia is the center of the earth, the center of the home, and our own per personal center, end quote. The circular hearth can be seen as a representation of a mandala of fire, a center of the self, the focus of the family, and a soul of the city. We hold the spark from the Templar holy flame, tending it within the psyche and the self, allowing for individuation in a container of warmth and relatedness. The senses are engaged, feeling not only heat but light, self-illumination through the alchemical environment of both the safe container and the heat of the flame. In the book I and Thou by Martin Buber, he posits that human life finds its meaning in relationships. In Buber's view, all of our relationships bring us ultimately into relationship with God, who is the eternal thou. I am instead using this concept in the context of Hillman's polytheistic psychology and how it relates to therapy and soul making. Buber explains that humans are defined by two word pairs, I, it, and I, thou. Quote, the it of I, it refers to the world of experience and sensation. By contrast, the word pair I, thou, describes the world of relations. This is the I that does not objectify any it, but rather acknowledges a living relationship. The I, thou, is not a means to some object or goal, but a definitive relationship involving the whole being of each subject." End quote. Hestia is a wonderful example of being in relationship as a presence, as a thou, and not as an object. Hestia represents presence rather than personality in a similar way as the therapist works at being present in relationship with other rather than projecting their own personality onto the client as an object. The intersubjectivity of the I and the thou of the therapist and client re creates relationship and reciprocity where a symbolic third, a divine communion with the gods of myth and meaning arises and a trinity of ephemeral presence emerges. Hestia gives us welcome and invites us to come and partake in the gathering of the gods and in soul making. The client then can come into relationship with the gods in the psyche, not as objects, but as real persons in relationship with the I. James Hillman states, quote, in regard to our specific topic in, we find in literalized as a defined place into which we go, the unconscious, the body, or to a definite time in the past. This literalization makes us forget what the master said, not the psyche is in me, but I am in the psyche. We forget and literalize the soul inside the skin, the mind inside the skull, the dream, the emotion, the memory inside the me. To the neglect of the collective psyche, the anima mundi, in which we live our lives all day long." End quote. So then, in an effort to step out of the literal end together, the client and therapist can be in the collective psyche together. 
and not only together in the temporal space of a 50-minute session, but bringing in the ancient and timeless by inviting the gods and goddesses within the sacred space. The way inward and to know the self, then, is through being witnessed by the other and sensing the presence of the Hestian flame within the ritual of the space being me in the psyche and within the self, the psyche being within me. The practice of stepping out of literalizing thought and into the relationship with myth is the work of therapy. Through these mythic images, one is able to view light and shadow of self, family, and society. The inner work of archetype is not an intellectual process only. Psyche is a golden thread which runs through collective unconscious to timeless spirit, or Elan. Unconsciousness, not as a black hole with overwhelming gravity, but rather a going in to have relationship with the gods in the psyche. The inner subjectivity between therapist and client, with Hestia as that symbolic third, invites the gathering of the gods and the inner work of soul making. This inner subjective posture allows for receptivity of the divine third, the polytheistic presence. By keeping vigil over the hearth of in, we hold sacred space for the encounter into psyche without objectification or literalization. We allow what is in to be met in an I-thou relationship without pursuit of an object, but only being in attitude of receptivity, hospitality, and welcome. This is relationship with the authentic polytheistic self, not in a forceful way, but in a posture of respect and gentle humility. Perhaps in attending to the other, we thereby know the gods in the psyche through the process, the other as a vessel of Hestian flame, illuminating and symbolizing warmth and mercy. Intersubjectivity, not for explanation or, lit or literalization, but for an insight as a way inward, an image of a collective unconscious that through our acceptance and experience of the other, we allow the creation of a personified mythological and archetypal image within ourselves. Thus, by tending the holy fire and creating a sense of home and hearth, we welcome connection to the depths and perhaps may encounter the real archetypal personification of Hestia, imagining her as an anima figure of the unconscious, a figure of psyche and soul. As James Hillman states, speaking about anima in revisioning psychology, quote, she is also the feeling of personal interiority. She brings the sense of having an interior life, changing events into experience that means me. She makes possible the inner ground of faith in myself as a person, giving the conviction that what happens matters to the soul and that one's existence is personal and important. She teaches personifying, and the first lesson of her teaching is the reality of her independent personality. The second lesson is love. She comes to life through love and insists on it, just as Psyche in the old tale is paired forever with Eros. Perhaps the loving comes first. Perhaps only through love is it possible to recognize the person of the soul, finding a mythical person who is its supportive ground." End quote. To me, it is the goddess Hestia who is the supportive ground for the person of the soul. The paradox of the Hestia archetype provides a place of both containment and freedom. It is through this going in that the soul comes to life and the flame is ignited. Hestia as a virgin anima figure is given permission to remain virgin, to remain individual and individuating. She is an example of the need to retreat from all distractions and meditate on what is sacred in the self. The deepening of our relationship to mythic figures can make one abler to recognize the gods at play among us, the archetypes both destructive and divine. Just as an icon is a representation of what is sacred, we are an image as a reflected shadow of the gods in psyche. The vessel Hestia provides allows for complexes to be worked through and the shadow aspect to be witnessed in sacred space. It is important to remember that we are tending a living flame, which can illuminate with her light and also burn with her heat. Two natures exist, one nurturing and life-sustaining, the other destructive. We are playing with fire. The safety of the therapeutic container is needed also to explore the paradoxical mythic personalities in the self. The dynamics of both human and divine relationships are paradoxical. 
In them exist at the same time love and hate, attachment and rejection, creation and destruction. The relationship of a child to father and mother are portraits in miniature of the relationship of self to the mythic gods and goddesses in Psyche. In the Hestia myth, instead of the devouring mother archetype, we witness a devouring father. Immediately after Hestia was born of mother Rhea, she experienced the devouring father and later was born again. In the myth of Hestia, we see that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And in her humility, she was given pride of place and the humble hearth was made the holiest of holies. It was her ability to find her own centeredness and honor her own virginity, which allowed her to be the hearth fire and source of inner knowing and consciousness to all of humanity. She is present without having body, seated in a place of honor without having a throne. Her essence is flame and it is never dying. She embodies peace, mercy, and refuge. Her sacrifices are nourishment for the gathering of family and community. Hillman writes, quote, analysis is a ritual of Hestia, that attentive focus called consciousness, and therefore analysis places its practitioners at her hearth. If Hestia is she who makes our work sacred, then what a patient does and what we do in the city hall to keep its coals glowing is as much a part of soul making as any dream any memory, any emotion, or any insight, end quote. What then is needed in the city hall or in the soul of the world to tend the fire? How can we be in an I-thou relationship with city, society, and world? What if the fire begins to destroy for lack of care? It then becomes overwhelming, and the need to contain the destruction becomes the priority. We rush to repair the relationship and seek to find a way inward into the soul of society and the world. The consequences of not tending to the hearth can be a breaking down of a different kind, a shattering of soul, of the other, of relationship, of family, of society, of the earth. The destructive flame within ourselves is also within the world, and it, perhaps it's during these times of destruction that we attend to the soul of the world. We shift from our own self-awareness and development from our own self-actualization and integration into the needs of the big O other, the other in the world, who we turn our consciousness towards in a spirit of welcome, mercy, and peace. And by doing so, now see the other in soulful relationship instead of just an object of pity and projection. The poor are always with you, and Hestia remains present with them, warming and welcoming in a spirit of peace through their suffering. Hestia doesn't take away the suffering, but she keeps vigil in every place and within every home. She keeps humble watch, honoring the flame for its power to warm, transform, and destroy. Whether conscious or unconscious, the flame burns within, within the earth, within the psyche, within the polis, within the society. It is part of what sustains us and maintains the earth, unseen and seen together. Sometimes you only see the light and not the flame, or only experience the burning heat that sears. The flame needs tending, and through that tending we are being transformed. We, by giving sacrifice of time, are honoring Hestia with the first and the last. We are shown mercy and welcome, and it is our place to receive in a spirit of illuminating transformation and gratitude, rather than in a spirit of self-condemnation pathologizing and resentment of the heat needed for alchemical change. When one is in the presence of the divine fire, one experiences light but also heat. The fire doesn't change. It is only the attitude of the person in the presence of the flame which determines the experience of either illumination or destruction. Hestia provides the living flame of the hearth, which illuminates but also casts shadow. In the mirrored myth of Vesta in Roman mythology, the Vestal virgins tended the flame, and if a virgin was suspected of infidelity to her calling, she was condemned and buried alive. They were considered instrumental to the security of Rome and took a vow of chastity in order to devote their lives to the rituals and tending of the sacred flame. They were not expected to fulfill the societal obligation to marry and bear children, but they could only remain virgins if they maintained chastity in service of Vesta for the service of Rome. They con the condemned virgins were seen as a type of scapegoat sacrifice for the shadow of the soul of the city. 
They were the object of projection of impurity and unworthiness for the Roman people. They were doing a disservice, however, to themselves because they literalized their own fear of retribution and lack, and by doing so only served to perpetuate a society of war and destruction. This is a burying of the feminine, without food or water, a bloodless death, but a death of deprivation and starvation, of moral judgment leading to wrongful death, a shaming and objectifying of the human nature, and a literalistic desire for feminine purity and perfection without purpose. No transformation, no integration, only destruction, using the feminine as kindling for the devouring flame. This is an example of projection of our societal desire to repress our own woundedness, our own unrealistic expectations of morality onto these open vessels, these feminine symbols of purity. If virginity is not only seen as purity, but as self, separate from the identification with family or spouse, then it takes on a different quality. Hestia requested and was allowed to remain self. She represents welcome, refuge, peace, and mercy. Mercy is given to those who need mercy, and through her humility, she shows warmth, compassion, and kindness to all those who are imperfect. Through inviting the spirit of Hestia, we can encourage these qualities of warmth, acceptance, and nurturance in ourself, in others, and in society, and to be imperfect as the gods are imperfect. Thank you.